In 2011, at the Adobe Mac show, there was a sneak preview of a new deblurring filter that attracted a lot of interest. And people were afterwards were looking at the videos on the internet and were wondering whether this was something that would arrive soon in Photoshop. Well, it didn't make it into Photoshop CS6, but it has now been included into Photoshop CC. And what I'm going to do here is show you the new shake reduction filter, which um, it should be pointed out is a filter for helping to deal with the problems of camera shake, not to do with lens blur. And this particular photograph is maybe a suitable candidate to demonstrate with because it was photographed uh, in a 50 mile per hour wind with a long focal length lens. And the blurriness you see here is as a result of the camera shake using a long shutter speed exposure. It does help that the uh, camera used was a good quality camera, so it's a fairly clean sensor. And it was also shot with low, uh, at a low ISO setting, so there isn't any problems in this image to do with ISO noise. With photographs that have been shot using cheaper cameras or shot in JPEG mode with JPEG artifacts or with a lot of ISO noise or photographs taken with a smartphone camera for example you can't expect to necessarily get such good results but to show you how the filter can be used let me go to the filter menu and choose from the sharpen sub menu shake reduction and this opens the shake reduction dialog you can see here and it straight away tries to apply a correction using the default settings that you can see here that have been auto applied. And if you're happy enough with it and it's an improvement upon what you had, you can just click the OK button and not worry too much about having to make any manual adjustments. But if you do want to, then I think you'll find it useful to click on this button, which is almost hidden here on the screen. Let me just click on this to reveal or release the loop view so that you can see a nice loop close up of the image, which you can scroll around on the picture to see more clearly the area that's of interest to you. So let me adjust the sliders here. We've got a blur trace bounds slider, which um, is usually best left set to the auto setting. I can reduce the amount down here. Um, what I'm trying to do is to match the, um, the length of the actual um, blur trace, which is represented down here in this little box. So I think for this particular image, it helps if I perhaps just increase the blur trace bounds amount for this particular one. And then you'll see that there is a source noise option, which at the moment is set to auto. You can choose to manually set this to low, medium or high, but in all the testing I've done, it seems sensible just to leave this set to the auto setting. Then we have below this, the smoothing slider. If left to the smoothest setting, let me just pop that back up again. If left to the smoothest setting, then it doesn't apply any smoothing at all, but you run the risk of seeing more artifacts in the image. If I increase this up to a higher setting, it will get rid of those artifacts, but at the expense of creating too smooth a result, which bearing in mind we're dealing with an image that's got the problem of camera shape. We don't want to end up with anything that's any sort of any uh, smoother or softer. So it's ideal to try and sort of take this down as low as you can without release, without revealing too many artifacts. And then with the artifact suppression, this is to do with the problems associated with what is sometimes known as ringing. Um, uh, if you increase the artifact suppression, you can suppress those artifacts from being a problem. Again, it's about finding the right balance in between the two. At the low setting, it does create some ringing, which I can see as being a problem there. And if I set it up too high, then it causes a problem of over smoothing the picture. So I'll try and choose somewhere in between the two to get the best result there. Now at the moment, I'm just using one blur estimation region to work with, but you can manually add others if you want to or reposition existing ones. So if I drag, you can see that I need to make sure I drag big enough an area to work with. So let me just deal with this area down here. And this creates a new blur trace, which is slightly different from the first one. It's worth pointing out that um, when you work with an image <clears throat> or when you're trying to process an image, you'll find that the amount of camera shake will vary from area to area in the frame. So sometimes it's worthwhile selecting more than one area to work with. And then what happens is, is that when you apply the filter, it blends between each of the blur estimation regions, um, the effects that have been applied. So looking at this area down here, let me just take the loop view down here so I can see more clearly what is going on. And I'm just going to work in reverse here on the sliders to go and see what would be the most appropriate adjustment to apply here. I think I'll keep it somewhere around the middle there for the blur, for the artifact suppression. 
And then for the smoothing, let me see if it helps to take this up higher or lower. I'll keep a little bit more detail in there. And then for the blur trace bounds, I think because it's a smaller amount, they're looking at the blur trace down below. I'm going to leave it set around about there. Then let me add another blur trace estimation region around this portion of the image. Now I think here there is a problem to do with ringing, which I mentioned. If I take the artifact suppression down, what you might be able to see around here is a certain amount of ringing that's taking place around the, around the flag. So I do need to take this up a little bit higher to try and get rid of that. And I'll increase the smoothing as well, a little bit more there as well. And then lastly, let me just come back up to this main blur estimation region and drag the loop view over there just to see if I can just check to see how those settings are working. I might revise some of those in light of what I've done elsewhere. And then when I'm happy with the adjustments which I've applied then, then I can just simply click OK. And this will apply the filter to the image. So let's have a look at the image a little bit more in close-up detail to see what the final result looks like. If I do an undo on there, you can see there's the before image. That's what I started off with. And then that's with the shake reduction filter being applied to it. And if I perhaps just zoom out from there at 50%, to see what it's like. That's before and that's after. It's helped to improve the picture a little bit. I'm not quite sure if I'm going to win any contracts from the Scottish Tourist Board to take photographs for them if this is the best that I can reduce for them, but it could sometimes be uh, a filter that might perhaps just give you the edge and save some shots and make them more usable. I have tried using this on a lot of pictures and worked a lot with the filter to see what you know, benefits it can have. It definitely helps if you're working with pictures which have, which have got a smooth uh, sensor quality to them, as opposed to pictures that have been shot, as I mentioned, on smartphones or cheap cameras. Uh, but in all honesty, I haven't found it to be quite the wow filter that I was hoping it to, to be. But it can be useful if you play around with it and persevere, I suppose. Also of interest as a sharpen filter is the Smart Sharpen, which um, has been around in Photoshop for a while. And in this um, demo, I'm going to show you um, just how much improved it is now working with an image which was taken actually of the same castle in Scotland, but photographed from the other side on the afternoon before. And uh, if I zoom in close on this photograph, or we'll go into a 100% view, you can see that there is uh, some blur in this picture here, which I would attribute to being lens blur as opposed to camera shake, which we were dealing with before. So to deal with this, I'm going to use the Smart Sharpen filter to improve the look here. And if I go to the filter menu, I'm first of all going to convert this to a Smart Filter because this uh, filter I'm about to apply, I regard as being a creator filter, which means that it's best applied selectively to an image rather than being applied globally. So by converting the layer, the background layer into a Smart Object, this gives me the ability when applying as a Smart Filter to re-edit where the filter is applied. So let me go to the filter menu and from the sharpen sub menu choose smart sharpen. And here you can see in the preview window that we get, we can see how effective the filter is. And I find generally that it helps to take it right up to the maximum setting the first time that you apply it because this really amplifies the effect. And so you can then see more clearly the effect that adjusting things like the radius will have on the picture. So I don't want to set the radius too high here, nor do I want to set it too low. So the idea is to try and find some sort of sweet spot in between. I think probably around about two would be about the right amount to apply in this instance. And we can see there's the before and there's the after. It's already started to help. With the noise reduction, um, you could maybe try a setting of about 10, which might help to reduce the, the noise in the image. Don't set it too high because, again, you're just introducing softness into the, into the photograph. But one of the key things to point out here with this, um, the new improvements being made 
If you compare working with SmartShop and now Photoshop CC with previous versions, you'll notice that there's much, much less artifacts generated as a result of the sharpening. At the moment, I'm applying a full 500% amount, and normally that would apply, uh, that would create a huge amount of um, artifacting in the preview that you see here. So um, it's really not such a problem now, which means that you can be a lot bolder when using this tool. But I'm going to take it down. I'm not going to go quite so high as um, as uh, 500. I'll take it down to a, a lower amount there. And oh, I should have pointed out as well that I'm using the lens blur option down here. There are options down here as well for shadows and highlights. Those haven't changed from previous versions, and I'm not going to adjust those today. So I'll just apply this filter to the image. And here we can see the after result in which I think, I'm sh as I'm sure you'll agree, you can see that the effect is a lot sharper compared to what we started out with. If I switch off the Smart, sharp, smart uh, Sharpen Smart Filter, you can see that's the before and that's the after. It's really made quite a big difference. The thing is, is that it's best to apply, as I say, locally to the image. You don't necessarily want to apply it uh, globally. So. In this instance, if I was to uh, fill with, uh, if I, sorry, target the smart filter here and then fill with black, I used Alt Delete there with black as the foreground color. This hides the smart sharpen filter effect. And if I select the brush tool now and then paint with white, so if I make white the foreground color, I can paint with the mask active so that I selectively apply the Smart Sharpen filter to the image, but just apply those, just apply it to those areas that I think really need the most adjustment. And then if we have a look again in close up at the picture to see how that's looking. Now you can see down here it's really a bit too strong, um, whereas up here it's kind of looking okay, but it may be, it might be still a little bit too much. So I'm going to double click on this button here to um, open up the blend options. And in the blending options, I can reduce the opacity perhaps, so I'll take it down to a slightly lower amount so that it's not quite so strong. So I'm just reducing the opacity for the filter effect and I'll click OK there. And I think that looks fine up there. Let me just see if that's made any improvement down below. I think actually it's a bit over sharpened because obviously the camera was fine focused into the, onto the foreground. It was more problem to do with the middle distance. So what I can perhaps do here now is with black as the foreground color and with the mask selected sorry, black is the foreground color there. I can just maybe just paint just gently over there with a pressure sensitive pen. So that it's not quite so strong in all those areas. And if I look now perhaps and see in close up how the picture's looking, I think the, sh the amount of sharpness down there is perhaps okay and imbalance more with what I've applied to the um, to the castle. So there's the before and there's the after. And I think in this instance, I think you'll agree that the the results that you can achieve using Smart Sharpen now, especially when used here as a creator filter, not to be applied globally in the same way as you might apply the Unsharp Mask filter or do capture sharpening using Camera Raw. Applied in this way, I think that there's a lot of scope now for using this to be able to help uh, rescue pictures where for example, the lens blur was to be a problem. Whether it would be enough to um, encourage the Scottish Tourist Board to hire me or not, I do not know. But uh, certainly useful to, as a demonstration of one of the new improvements that have now been made to working with the sharpened filters in Photoshop.